Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would allow us to trust you in these most uncertain times. We thank you, Lord, for all of who you are and all that you're doing in our lives. Thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to come together and feast together on your word. I just ask that you would teach us, O oh Lord, so that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you, filtering out all of that which is foolish, but sealing to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. This is uh, part 20. And uh, I want to say, uh, mention right, right here up front, I want to say a few things. Uh, I've been asked to comment on what's going on, and I just simply refuse to do so. I, I don't, I'm not a political analyst. I don't know exactly where all of this is, how, how all of this is going to unfold here. I'm talking about what's primarily taking place in the United States. Uh, what I do believe, and what I will say, is I will say that there's a pattern in Scripture. And that, is, that pattern that we see repeatedly is, is, is that our God most often determines that there will be a, a different uh, a change in the course of human history, a different direction. He'll take uh, human history in a different direction. When his people are disobedient, when there's wickedness and when there's a rebellion, he, uses, he usually alters the course of human history. That's been the pattern. That was the pattern with the, the Great Flood. Uh, that was the pattern with the, uh, uh, the, the Israel wandering in the wilderness uh, where that they uh, were to enter the Promised Land. And so, at least in my understanding, it's when everything is going along fine and everything, things don't typically tend to change too much. And so I, I believe that it's, I, it's safe to assume that things are going to, to change dramatically in the next few weeks and months and, and years. Now, many of you uh, who have followed this channel, you know that, you know, I, I published a timeline for spring 2021 back in the fall of 2018. We stood by that uh, ever since. Uh, there are reasons, many reasons, I believe, uh, that for looking forward to uh, spring being the most likely season, I believe, of his return for the church. So I just wanted to say that uh, up front here. Uh, I just hope everyone remains safe out there, that you will place your trust in Him, not in human government, uh, because we know that the days are short. I also want to take a moment to thank you, all of you who comment on these videos. Uh, I may not always uh, comment back, but I do appreciate your involvement, uh, your comments. Uh, which I try to read every one. I want to thank you for all your prayers for the direction of this ministry as well as for my health, which is an ongoing concern and an ongoing uh, discovery as far as, as where that's, uh, what direction I'm headed as far as that is concerned. And I'll have more information on that as time goes by. So I want to just thank you for all of your prayers. Know that I am praying for all of you constantly, not just you, but your friends and your loved ones. Uh, and I want to thank you all for your support of this channel, which, uh, of, of which we could not do this if it were not for that. So we're going to continue on in our study in the book of Revelation. We've come to, uh, basically, we've come to chapter 7 in our study.
atheistic, and and I, you know, I, I hate even using that term. I, I don't believe there's an atheist. There, there's ever been an atheist, a true atheist. But those who profess to be atheists, uh, the builders of the first atom bomb, they were dedicated to the idea that, well, if if we had a weapon that our enemies didn't have, it would end all war. It would end war for all time. You know, nobody's going to fight against somebody that has machine guns when all they have, you know, is uh, is a slingshot. Yet, these scientists, not all of them, I'm just, but most of them, many of them, they were kneeling to pray at Almogordo before that bomb went off. You know, praying to who? You know, I don't think they knew. You know, I think that if I had been there and I would have saw one of them praying, I, I would have, you know, went to them and I would have said, uh, you know, well, first of all, I would have said, you know, I would have told them that they're not going to destroy God's world. Uh, but I, I, would have, I would have just said, who are you praying to? And, and I don't think that they, they could have told me. And so in our study here, you know, we came to the end of chapter 6, the sixth seal. And, and we saw that they said to their, the rocks and the mountains, they spoke to the rocks and the mountains, they said to their idols to fall on them and hide them from God and from the face of God, the wrath of the Lamb. You know, they placed their trust in, in that which is foolish and untrustworthy. And that's what the ungodly do. So if they really know that this is God's wrath, why wouldn't they flee to Him? And, and I'm, folks, I'm going to suggest it's because the gospel is not an invitation to the flesh to do something to be redeemed, that we're not born again according to our own will, but by the will of God. And only those who are His can come to Him. You know, it might seem foolish to us to think that in the midst of a single great mega earth shaking, you know, that they would pray to the rocks and the mountains. But we need to understand the absolute hostility between the natural man and God. The natural man cannot discern the things of the Spirit. The, the natural man cannot please God. So they make a foolish prayer. They trust in things that are not God. Whereas we, on the other hand, we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ in a God that we know. As I pointed out previously, the church was called a mystery. It was not revealed in Christ's day. It was not revealed in the Gospels. It was purposely hid from ages and generations, but is now revealed to the apostles. So you won't find it in the parables of Matthew 13. You won't find the church in the 24th chapter of Matthew. You know, in contrary to conservative biblical teaching, and uh, many of you out there, if, if I mentioned the word dispensationalism, you'd know what I was talking about. There are, there are so many Christians that believe that when they're reading the Gospels, particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that they're seeing the church there. Folks, the, the church was not there. That, that shouldn't be hard to understand that the church did not begin until Acts, until Pentecost. And uh, so there's a lot of biblical teaching, a lot of uh, ministries, pastors, uh, institutions, Bible colleges, seminaries, 
you know, that are not dispensational in their teaching. They don't make that distinction. And therefore, as a result of that, there's a whole lot of confusion. You know, Paul's epistles, all 13 of his epistles are primarily the, I mean, that's the very lifeblood of the church. It's not that we can't gain insight from the Gospels, that we can't uh, uh, gain truth from the Gospels, that we, there's not application of truth there in the Gospels. All, all Scripture is for us. It's just it was not all written to us. We have to make that distinction. And I think that's uh, even more important, uh, or not any less important at least, I could say, when we come over to the book of Revelation. So beginning at chapter 4, chapter 4, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. You know, we begin the chapter where a door was open in heaven. It was already open. It wasn't opening, but it was already open. As, as far as you and I are concerned, we pick up where the teaching in the Gospels concerning the kingdom left off with the death of Jesus Christ. Christ's ministry, He was offering the kingdom and Himself as king. Israel rejected both the kingdom as well as their king. So we have the church age enters the picture. It's a parenthesis. And we're picking up here again on that in our study in Revelation. That's what I want you to see. Uh, so we pick up where the teaching in the Gospels concerning that Gospel of the Kingdom left off. That, By the way, that's, that's the Gospel that we see preached during the tribulation with, with the death of, of Christ right before Pentecost or that the church, which was a mystery, you know, it's in parenthesis, you know, because, because from Pentecost on we have a mystery that wasn't revealed until the apostles. So when we begin chapter 4, as far as, far as the Gospels are concerned, we are beginning just before Pentecost. So when Christ talks about, you know, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, well, it is. It is. And that's where we are in chapter 5. And that whole period, that whole period of the church, the church age, that mystery is not seen here in the text. So we are as far as we're concerned, shortly after the crucifixion of Christ, since the mystery has dropped out. So we are at the day of the Lord. So chapter 6. This chapter 6, this reveals that time, the day of the Lord. Okay? Not a Sunday. The day of the Lord. A period that describes a time which begins after the rapture of the church, which I believe extends all the way through the thousand-year reign of Christ. The day of the Lord. And the, we saw the first writer went forth conquering and to conquer. You know, how long did he go? I believe seven years. I believe chapter 6, verses 1 through 17, covers a period of time from the rapture of the church to the end of the 70th week of Daniel. And now we begin chapter 7. And in chapter 7, we have a pause. We, we have a quick review of the 70th week of Daniel or the wrath of God. We've reached that age where that His great wrath is here and nobody is able to stand. And we're going to pause that. And so we read the, the very beginning of the chapter. The chapter starts out. We read, after these things. Okay? 
Forget the word things. It's not there in the original text. After this, says the Greek. After this. And so, we see another vision. Okay? Uh, I tried my hand at filmmaking, and I wasn't all that great at it. But what I did learn was is that you can set up multiple cameras to film the same scene. That you can also go back in time in your in your movie. You can also do that in writing a book. You see that all the time. It's common. People people recognize that. They see that. You'll be reading a novel. It'll flash back in time to a time previous. You'll be watching a movie, and it'll it'll say one year earlier, or it'll say one year later. I mean, movies, books, they do that all the time. Okay. Now, we begin chapter 7, and we have a pause. We have a quick review of the 70th week. We've reached that age where his, his, his wrath is here. Nobody's able to stand, and we're going to pause that. And so we read, after these things, after this, and we see another vision. Another vision. This is not the same vision, folks. This is not... This is different from, from the door opening in heaven. A door was open after this, after this. We see the same phrase there. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. That's chapter 4. Now we're in chapter 7. After this, again we see after this. Okay, are you getting this? Uh we see another vision. It's another vision. I don't know, you know if you want to look at it as a different camera angle. Uh, it's really not, you couldn't really do that because it's not the same scene. Well, maybe it is, but it's just, it's looked at differently. Okay? But it, it, is, but it is another vision. And what we see are, are four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, I hope that I can kind of give you my take on this, and it may not be the uh, what you you may it may you may not uh, you may find out it's not what you've formerly thought that it, it was. But I'm going to try to explain my position on this. The four angels here in the in the in the text that are standing on the four corners of the earth. They're standing there on the four corners of the earth. They're holding the four winds of the earth. Okay? Four angels. Four winds. Four corners of the earth. Uh, and many of you understand, you, you, you know my fascination with numbers. I think sometimes we can push those, these numbers to the extreme, but, but I just want you to take note that of, of the numbers. God gave us numbers for a reason. Four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Now, and you can take those, you know, I, you, you can take that literally, you can take that figuratively or symbolically. You know, you can, you can say, you could say, well, the earth is, is, the, it represents Israel and, and the sea represents the, the, the the Gentile nations or or the, the people of the earth. Uh, now, I happen to, to think that those four winds, folks, are our four horsemen in the previous chapter. That, that's not the four angels, okay? They're not the horsemen but the four winds. So now we are back before, don't get confused, please, but we are, I'm, I want to suggest that now we're back before the beginning of chapter 6. The seals have not been opened yet. It's another vision. It's not the first vision. It's another vision which began in chapter 4, when a door was opened in heaven, which 
we know followed the the letters to the seven churches. You know, and it's it's just like when you're reading a novel or watching a movie, you know, and it flashes back to a previous time. So another angel, another angel, that makes it now a total of five angels, five, okay? This is another angel. He comes from the east, which I believe is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I believe. Now, you don't have to believe that. Uh, that's what I believe. Verse 2, And I saw another angel ascending from the east. The, the original text says, Having ascended from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. We're about to see these servants sealed. Okay? The servants of God sealed in their foreheads. Having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels. That's the ones holding back the four winds. Okay? Which I believe are the four riders okay, of the apocalypse. He cried with a loud voice to the four angels. Now that, that could be the four beasts of chapter 6. Okay? Or it could be four other angels. But he, he cried with a loud voice to the four angels. And remember, the four beasts were seen saying, Come and see. Okay? So this angel, Christ, cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. All right? Saying, in verse 3, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees. Now, if, is this... <sighs> Stop and think. Okay? If this follows, if, this is, if these things that we've been looking at happen in succession, and now we've seen the six seals, and we came to the part of the end of chapter 6, where the, at the end of the sixth seal, they were going into the, the caves, the dens, the rocks, crying for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them. I mean, we're looking at a point in which these servants of God have not yet been sealed in their foreheads. Stop and think. It cannot, that cannot be the case, okay? Okay, I think that what we are seeing here is another vision where that these servants of God are sealed before the four horsemen begin their ride, okay? Which is ex explained to us in the four angels that are holding back the four winds, okay? If, if, I hope that makes sense. I, I, I truly do. This, this can be confusing it, it, in the sense that, because I can hear, I can just hear someone now. Well, Steve, why didn't God just put chapter 7 where chapter 6 is and put chapter 6 where ch chapter 7 is? Then it would have flown beautifully and it would have all made sense. It would have been a whole lot more clear. And I've got an answer for that, I think. Uh, you know, you, uh, I'll take a stab at that anyway. He didn't do that. He could have done that, but he didn't do that. He didn't do that. God didn't do that. He obviously didn't do that. But, folks, this is how I'm looking at that. He cried with a loud voice to the four angels, which I, I believe those are the four beasts of chapter 6. Okay? To whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth. Neither the six. Well, I thought that the six writers had really done a lot of hurting back there. Okay, he says her, her, that they hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, until 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 we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. These then being sealed, and the word sealed means it's a seal of ownership. God owns them. They're owned. They're His property. They, they belong to Him. But more than that, they're protected. So, they're, they're sealed, protected, before the seals began to be opened. That's how, that's how I have to see this, folks. 
not in sequence, logical, linear, chronological, you know, sequence. Which, personally, folks, I don't have any problem with that. I don't find that strange at all. Steve, I, that seems kind of weird to me. It doesn't seem weird to me, folks. It, I mean, we'll be we will see. We'll be shown that John had different visions. Okay? You know, well, I, you know, I, and I, I'll admit, if we just... If we just made chapter 7, chapter 6, and made chapter 6, chapter 7, you know, we switched their places in the text, you know, you know, John would have been shown that these servants of God being sealed before the beginning of the seals being opened. So why didn't Christ just do that? Keep it simple, you know, not make it confusing, not make it hard. I think he wants us to study. You know, I've said it's it's not strange that he'd do that. Folks, we know books and stories and novels, even movies, they often flash back to the past or they, fla they flash forward to the future. You know, uh, a past event, a future event. So I don't find that odd. I don't find that weird. You know, Revelation's not chronological. Folks, the Bible itself is not in sequence. So... These tribulation saints, these servants of God, are sealed. That is, they are, they are protected with a seal of ownership. And I'm convinced that these chapters were, were designed in such a way so that we'll study. I mean, really study. You know, God could have easily revealed, construct, constructed, designed, uh, arranged these chapters he, he, he could have constructed this book like like a broadway play you know where you just sit and you watch it from beginning to the end from the you know curtain opens you see the play the curtain drops you have different scenes the scenes are played out in consecutive order that is not the book of revelation folks that's not it okay that's that's a broadway play so, so now we're looking at the 144K, the 144,000. So, you know, that opens up a big, you know, Pandora's box of, you know, ideas, interpretations, viewpoints. Uh, if you read through the commentaries, if you, if you pick up six commentaries, you'll probably find six different ideas as to who these 144,000 people are. So I'm going to give you... Uh, uh, I'm not going to go through all of those, but I'm, I'm going to give you what I believe is the right one. Now, some of you may laugh at that, but that's, uh, and, I, and I hope you do. I, I could be wrong too, folks. I, I'm just giving you what I believe this. You, you folks need to study this book to see if these things be, be so. Don't ever believe anything just because I believe it. Uh, but I don't know what to do other than just to tell you what I think. Now, there are Christians who, they either interpret this 144,000 as a literal, they're, they're literally 144,000 people, or they believe that the number 12, because they're from the 12 tribes of Israel, that number 12 it symbolizes what that symbolizes is a multitude. That's an indefinite number of people. You know, these are sealed. The number is 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 not the the hundred forty four thousand. That's not the total number saved during the tribulation period. But the total uh, uh, it's the total literal. I believe literal number of those who belong to Christ during that that time and we're not there yet this is the day of the Lord uh, who belong to Christ and who will minister salvation to multitudes during the tribulation period they are not not the church okay 
you know, in which there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. Well, that one is one is a Jew inwardly. The church has been has been removed, folks. We're not we're not there. We're in heaven. The context concerns Israel and the and the Gentiles, those who have made this earth their permanent abode during that time. And the fact is, is that no clear cut example of the church being called Israel exists in the New Testament. Nor does it exist in ancient church writings until A.D. 160. This 144,000, and this is just my opinion, it, it is likely a result of the two witnesses ministry. It's, they sprung out of that, okay? I mean, though God Himself seals these individuals with His ownership and protection, you know, we're... Uh, where the 144,000 then spread the gospel of the kingdom globally, leading to the salvation of, of I, you can't, I don't know, untold numbers, uh, millions. You know, that we see, uh, people that we see referenced, redeemed individuals that are, sa are re saved during that period, we'll see that in, in the ninth verse of chapter 7. Now, you know, even though it's true that 12 does symbolize completeness, perfection, God's power, His authority, that number 12 uh, is, highly, is a, a number that highly represents God's authoritative power. And even though that's true, and, you know, and that 12 multiplied, you know, by itself and then again by a thousand, you know, even though that indicates completeness and perfection, and, and even though much of this book, you, you can't argue the fact that much of Revelation, of Revelation is symbolic, I have to reject that view since I, I'm, I'm pretty adamant about taking a, a strict, literal approach to the interpretation of Scripture unless there's evidence to the contrary, unless something's showing me that, that I shouldn't. I see these as a literal 144 thousand from the twelve tribes of Israel. You know, God could have easily, He could have very easily written a multitude which no man could number were sealed. He could have said that, but He didn't. And I think that gives significance to the, to the strict, literal number of 144,000. If 144,000 means millions, well, then why did he say 144,000? It just doesn't make any sense to me. For me, and for me, the key word to take note of here is the word sealed. He didn't say only 144,000 will be redeemed. He didn't say that, you know, which would actually contradict Scripture that says an untold number of people will be redeemed. Nor did he say a multitude no man could number were sealed. He didn't say that. So I have to take this number literally. Now, I love Spurgeon, all right? I always have. And I, I, I hate picking on, on him, especially. I hate picking on anybody. But Spurgeon described the 144,000 as a great multitude which no man could number. I, why he did that is beyond me. I, you know, but God could have simply said that, yet he didn't. Spurgeon also wrote concerning the tribe of Dan, not being mentioned here because he's not you won't see the tribe of Dan in these 12 tribes well that means that uh, well we'll never understand all the things of God all right, that's kind of taking the easy way out I, I, I have to disagree with that too the tribes that are mentioned represent those who are sealed not tribes that became extinct due to idolatry I mean, in fact, if you, if you really were to be honest, every single one of the 12 tribes at one point, at some point in time, were disobedient. Uh, but uh, Dan and Ephraim is not listed among the 12 tribes. Levi and Joseph took their place. They were included. And so, why... 
the ban of Dan. Uh, sometimes I check to see if my mic fell to the floor. Why don't you see Dan? I, I don't believe... What I don't believe is it's, it's because, well, uh, the Antichrist comes out of the tribe of Dan, which is, I actually believe that the Antichrist comes out of the tribe of Dan. But I, I don't believe that's the reason. You know, you know, so, so, so there, it, it, we're, that, that would be like 11,999 are punished because of one of them is the Antichrist. The whole tribe is punished because of, I, I don't know, that doesn't make sense to me either. I mean, to me, the message is clear. If they reject the only name given to them by which they can be saved, that's, that's, a, that's a phrase taken right from Acts chapter 4, then they too will be absent from the kingdom, just like the tribes of Dan and Ephraim are not included in the 12 tribes making up the 144,000. It doesn't matter to God if, if you were a child of Abraham or not. God is no respecter of persons. We are all, we learned this from Paul, we see it in Galatians and other places, that we are children of promise. Uh, but he does acknowledge, God does acknowledge those that are his. The point is, you and I have no access to God, to the Father, except through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, which is based on grace and grace alone in any any of us. Any one of us can fall into, idro, into idolatry, uh, become rebellious. You know, in idols, we know the idols aren't just necessarily carved images. You know, you got a little, I've got a little thing up here. It's got a, it's a candle, it's got a feather, bird feather stuck in it, and it's got a rock that says hope. I don't know if you can see it. You know, I guess that's my idol. I mean, you know, if, uh, I, I think watching too much uh, gun smoke can, you know, gun smoke can become an idol. Okay. But, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting sidetracked here that the, the uh, sin is a result of having a fallen nature. These aren't individuals are not new creations in Christ. And, and just as much, right, or just as important, righteousness is not the result of one's own good works. And so that person will be missing like the tribe of Dan for the reason that he's not a child of God. And they haven't worshipped the one true God because they're not children of God. They're not children of promise. You know, it was Paul that said, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this. This sub. Let's see here. Although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. That's Romans chapter 1. Sounds very much like the tribe of Dan when they worshipped the golden calves as well as, as those atheistic scientists at Almogorda, New Mexico, who knelt and prayed to a God that was not God. So those who are not His during that period will be like Dan and Ephraim, and they'll have no part in the kingdom of God. All they have to look forward to 
is the wrath of God. Well, I can see I'm out of time. I love you all. I truly do. Stay safe out there. Thank you once again for everything. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.